Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we're going to talk about some area of interest that an analyst named Otto Kernberg brought forward. Some time ago he wrote an article called Malignant Narcissism and Large Group Regression, but this was a topic that was particularly important for him. So, malignant narcissism is a kind of severe psychological syndrome which is an amalgam of certain traits of narcissistic personality disorder with antisocial behavior and paranoia and aggressive tendencies. Such a person is often extremely self-absorbed, manipulative, vindictive, unempathic, but ready to exploit others at the drop of a hat. And those kinds of leaders can be highly attractive to large groups who are experiencing an aggression, a regression. So groups like this, for a number of reasons, regress to a more primitive state inside themselves, a less mm-hmm. mature psychological mm-hmm. state. And this typically occurs when people are under an enormous amount of stress or perceived threat. And then the group collectively adopts simplistic, even childlike modes of thinking and behavior, which make them more dependent on an authoritarian leader. Mm. So we're going to roll up our sleeves, really talk about this in a meaningful way. And as the listeners no doubt will guess, this seems particularly timely. And I would say not just in the United States, but this phenomena of groups that collapse under the leadership of a malignant narcissist is happening all over the world right now. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just human, right? This is just... I'd like to just unpack the idea of what we mean by regression, Mm -hmm. Uh, just so we're all, at least the three of us, (laughs) can be clear for listeners about that. Uh, You know, that we regress not, uh, we regress all the time. We regress if we're ill. Um, Kids regress sometimes when, you know, a a new sibling is brought home, that this child has been the only child, and then all of a sudden, um, there's, there's a threat in a way. It's supposed to be wonderful to have a little baby sister or brother, but it's far less attention to that two-year-old, or five-year-old. Illnesses are regressive. And I I think if you pay attention, I think almost everybody has experienced this, of of, of feeling young, feeling needy. Uh, You know, psychologically, we're not ourselves when we're physically unwell. so all kinds of things can cause an altogether human phenomenon that we, we call regression. Uh, we're on a, a sort of a sliding scale, as it were. Yeah, and um, I feel like, by the way, I feel like I have all these like things in front of me because it's such a complex topic that I have like my right. books and everything. So <laughs> I'm like trying to struggle to keep it all together. But but um. Deb, that's such a great point. I'm really glad that you kind of stopped us and and we talked about re- regression a little bit. I mean, and and Kernberg talks about you know some work that Beyond did with groups, and there was this identification that sometimes groups come together to do a particular task. So I don't know. It could be the three of us is a small group, and we mm-hmm. come together to record the podcast and. 
you know, there may be um, personality issues that come into play, or let's not call it personality issues. Let's uh-huh. call it group dynamics. Although, of course, when you're as um, individuated as we are, that doesn't happen. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, but that in general, groups that come together to perform a function tend to do that relatively well. But he was looking at, you know, what happens when groups don't have that shared intentionality? What starts to happen? What starts to coalesce? And so we're really talking about mass psychology, which is something that Jung actually wrote a lot about. And mm-hmm. Jung was very distrustful of it. He pretty much had nothing good to say about it. Um, and I, I suspect that Kernberg mm-hmm. mostly would agree with him. Yeah. I want to take a little loop back. Vion uh, is a British, he was a British analyst, and his first name is Wilfred. Uh, but he was not somebody who lived in an ivory tower. Uh, he was a tank commander, and uh, I have forgotten what else, but uh, he, had, yeah. he had plenty of experience in the so-called real world uh, hmm. with group dynamics, and it, that was his, his foundational experience for theorizing. Hmm. And then I think he actually did some experiments, right? Where yeah. he brought groups together and kind of watched what happened. Mm-hmm. And Gestalt, um, which some listeners know, and I know you two know, um, is group, 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 interpersonal, interpersonal. And uh, we're always working in groups, large group, half the group, dyads, triads. Uh, so it's um, obviously important to universal um, and fraught with uh, well-documented difficulties. Mm-hmm. So I know that we've talked about regression as a natural stress response. You mm-hmm. see it more in children in as much as they have less ego strength. Often, by the time we're adults, hopefully, our ego feels more muscular, we have more resources, and while we may even feel the tug to regress, Sometimes out of pure determination, we can kind of muscle ourselves forward or at least contain ourselves so that we're not acting out, throwing Mm -hmm. a tantrum, for instance, in the middle of the grocery store because they don't have something that we needed. So Kernberg was understandably interested in the danger of large group regression. Mm -hmm. First, as you were saying, Lisa, you know, what, how do large groups even coalesce? And that can be, you know, because of political party, because of religion, Mm -hmm. uh, because of national identity, Mm -hmm. um, any number of different ways that a group can decide that they are an in-group, that we have some kind of a shared belief task that brings us all together. So as soon as a group comes together, there's a phenomena that Jung talked about, and he borrowed from anthropology, something called a participation mystique, that even when a group is not under stress, there is an activation of a level of the psyche, an ancient part of the psyche, that encourages groups of human beings to act like a herd, mm-hmm. or like a <laughs> flock of uh, starlings mm-hmm. in the sky, these, you know, incredible murmurations where these clouds of birds will soar into these um, uh, in, amazing acrobatic shapes in the sky, then we are part of nature. Mm. So yeah. there is a part of us that um, yeah. links us and pushes us to act in a kind of herd mentality. Mm-hmm. And that can become increasingly more intense when the group is under an enormous amount of Mm -hmm. stress. And that's when, you know, see this in in movies or uh, documentaries, uh, uh, someone will fire a gun and a whole herd will stampede. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's a panic reaction. And of course, this happens. The thing that is a little more pernicious is that because of the ubiquity of social media and all forms of media, 
that groups can be formed by appealing to a certain kind of identity, and then media itself can be manipulated to frighten those specific groups. Mm, yes. And if, if a group is manipulated into a state of fear powerfully enough, then they enter into a large group regression and they begin to look for a leader to take care of them, to manage or the promise of resolving the thing that is deeply frightening to them. Mm. You know, and I want to say in, in, the, in the article that Kernberg wrote, uh, he talks about um, genocide. And he talks about some research that was done on genocide. And Joseph, to your point, um, what I recall is that when I worked in the former Yugoslavia, you know, I remember I was, you know, relatively young when I went. I was 28. And I was like, how does this happen? How does this happen? How does neighbor... You know, people would tell me stories like, yeah, we'd live next door to our neighbors for, you know, generate, you know, for 40 years and we'd never had any problems with them. And then they got their pitchforks and came after us one night. And it's like, how does that happen? You know, but one of the ways that happened was just like you're saying, Joseph, the media, the, the, the Serbs, the, um, you know, elements of the Serbian government started transmitting propaganda. Uh -huh. You'd better be worried about your, you know, your Bosnian, your Bosnian Muslim neighbor because he might come get you. And so then that motivated people to take up arms. And it's, you know, we, we, we can easily be um, agitated. You know, I, I saw something, I saw a a meme on social media. I have no idea. I haven't verified it. I should have verified it before I started recording this morning. But apparently, Kurt Vonnegut said, and I don't know if this is true, but it's still a great metaphor. If you put brown ants and red ants in a jar, they won't kill each other. But if you start, if you shake the jar, they will begin to kill each other. And the red, red ants will think of the black ants as their enemy and vice versa. So the question is, Who's shaking the jar? It's a powerful metaphor. Wow, yeah. that is that yeah. is really great. I love yeah. that. And, and it really um, depicts how easily agitated we are. Yeah. Yes. You know, I think we like to think when we're adults that we're really in charge of ourselves and we're aware and rational and capable and all that good stuff. We are a species just like zebra or buffalo. Or the ants. The ants, herd animals in particular. Uh, we like to bond, we like to belong, uh, and we are more fragile and more easily agitated than we like to think we are. And that goes to what you were saying, Joseph, about, you know, the, the, then the group that is agitated looks for a leader. Mm -hmm. Because that will coalesce the group around a center point and provide some, perhaps, illusion or delusion of uh, cohesiveness and stability, uh, etc. And, and, and quite so. So mm -hmm. groups now can be manipulated, mm -hmm. and then they can be kind of terrorized or at least put under stress. So. If you're in a group and they're constantly telling you, you're at risk, you're at risk, or your money is going to, my goodness, your money is going to dissolve, or these people are going to take it over, or you won't have food, or everything you hold holy and dear is going to be right. ripped out from your hands. Yes. And that message is repeated over and over and over again. Um, if you're susceptible to that, you're going to build up a lot of stress mm -hmm. and a lot of fear and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that right. makes us susceptible. Right. One of the things that I find so uncanny, and I've even seen this with my friends, is that when people are highly susceptible, they begin to repeat slogans, mm -hmm. which are childlike solutions, like burn it all down. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, oh, sleepy Joe, nasty woman. 
like the kinds of three word responses, yeah. three word framings that all of a sudden seem brilliant. Oh, 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 that's it. That's the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it must, it, it can all be summed up in three words. Let's, let's launch. Uh, let's, mm -hmm. let's do it. Right. And so that's a great point, Joseph. I think anytime that you, you notice a group, uh, you, you know, relying on slogans, it really kind of replaces thought. Right. And it's an oversimplified right. answer. But I, I want to say something at this point, and I'm, I'm sure I'll say it again, is that mm -hmm. as we're talking about this, I would like to issue a challenge both to us and to our listeners. It's very easy to notice these dynamics in groups you don't like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as we're circumambulating this, just think uh, the groups that I'm aligned with, the groups that I participate in, where are these dynamics there? Because um, they may be more egregious in some parts of the culture. Um, but I think we can probably all find mm -hmm. it in every corner. And it's good to be aware of that. Um, I do just want to bring in our friend Carl for a second. Here's just a little quote. He says things like this repeatedly in the collected works. He says, the, the elementary axiom of mass psychology is that the individual becomes morally and spiritually inferior in the mass. So he really, you know, Joseph, and what you were talking about, the participation mystique, you know, he, he really felt like, um, there's a kind of lowering of the state of consciousness when we're acting in a group. A regression. Yeah, a regression. Absolutely. So, uh, and we divide, we divide into us and them mm -hmm. uh, readily, easily, uh, and uh, we can see it all the time. Um, we can certainly see it in demonstrations and slogans and so on. Uh, and this goes to the concept of shadow. Um, you know, as what happens out there, it has a corollary inside us of the other group, them, they. <laughs> That's not me. It has nothing to do with my shadow. Uh, what I have disowned. Uh, it's clear cut. It's binary. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing how easily we can be agitated. The jar can be shaken, and the red ants and the black ants go at it. It happens in groups, and it happens internally. So coming back to Kernberg's work, mm -hmm. he found a way of describing the large group regressions into two categories. One he thought of as a dependency group and the other mm -hmm. as a fight or flight group. And so under stress, the dependency groups are characterized by a general sense of insecurity, uncertainty, and immaturity. And that group is looking for a particular kind of leader who can provide direction, security, and meet mm -hmm. their needs. And this is essentially a parental figure. So they'll often seek somebody who is self-assured, knowledgeable, somewhat um, parental. And this kind of a leader will often reassure the group. And in that way becomes idealized in an almost virtuous or moral standing. Mm -hmm. And the promise is you'll be safe and secure. Mm. and and that kind of a leader um, has a tendency to have a, a soothing, almost mm -hmm. sleepy, comforting effect on the group. Yeah, Kernberg uses the term tranquilizing. Tranquilizing. Wow. 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 He mentioned a third one, too, didn't he? The, um, the pairing uh, that wants a, a leader that has charisma. I think he said erotic, but I would translate it as charisma. Uh, someone who's exciting and dynamic, uh, and then we can pair. Well, I think that that goes is a little more present in the fight or flight group. Ah, 
where the fight or flight group is characterized by tension and conflict and readiness for combat. <laughs> and they are, you know, looking at the out group, the dangerous people out there. And that group is brought together through the idea of the common enemy and is maintained through a sense of shared combativeness. And that kind of a leader is often strong and self-righteous, distrustful, controlling, and capable of directing the group in its struggles against enemies. And that kind of group, there's a very strong us and them. Yeah. And that encourages more of that splitting and projection onto the adversaries. So this, the group that's looking for soothing and reassurance, and then the group that's looking to fight. And I think that the malignant narcissism seems to be more involved with the group that's looking for combat mm. than for soothing. Well, and they and and he talks specifically mm. about how that that uh, fight or flight group really um, engenders and seeks a kind of paranoia, and that there could be a strong strain of paranoia in in the leader, but also in the group itself, where you know you're you you sort of see enemies around every corner. And of mm-hmm. course, it's very easy to manipulate and control people when they're afraid. And we can all think back to 9-11. Mm-hmm. You know, the United States, uh, all of us as Americans, we, most of us have never experienced anything like that on American soil. And I remember being you know, tremendously affected I remember the first time I was in an airport after 9-11 and I saw armed soldiers in the airport. Yeah. I, I felt tearful with gratitude mm-hmm. that, that someone was there to take care mm-hmm. of me and to take care of us, which is very much that large group regression. I felt yeah. like a child and I was looking to this armed uh-huh. authority yeah. to keep me safe. And, okay. I, and I was all in. Yeah. Uh, at that point. So it was, it really constellated, you know, that wish uh, for leadership in a kind of parental authoritative way, um, but take care to protect. Right. I was on a plane after 9-11 on September 17th. And of course the plane was possibly one third full because people had canceled. Yeah. And there were men. Uh, across the aisle and, uh, you know, within easy eyesight of one another. And they talked about how they would fight if anything happened. You know, do we all agree we'll, we'll fight uh, if anybody tries anything. Uh, we're just so permeable and, and easily affected a- as humans, how we're made. And I suppose if we are responding to an actual threat, it may, I'm sure it has helped us as a species to survive by Mm -hmm. coming together as a group and facing true dangers. Mm -hmm. Where I think Kernberg was interested, as was Jung, as were many who observed World War II particularly, is seeing how vulnerable we are to neurotic and illusory stressors Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or those that have been created by manipulative actors exactly and and that is well of course as we know is incredibly dangerous Mm -hmm. and there's a way of manipulating this core level of the psyche in individuals and people who normally would behave in very sophisticated thoughtful ways right Mm -hmm. right. wind up in a feverish um alignment yeah, you know, I want to, uh, this brings up for me, Lisa, what you did just a little while ago, and when you uh, to- gave us the metaphor of the ants in a jar, mm-hmm. uh, you cited the source and then you said, but I haven't verified it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I, I, you know, there is um, a small point that's a big point, that we have to verify what we think is happening today. because. We are easily agitated, 
And if we see something on social media that says, in effect, the sky is falling, we need to verify it. Where do we go to make sure that's true? Uh, just like you said, wait a minute. Um, I would need to really verify the source here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that's a good point. And sometimes it's, it's, it's hard. And sometimes we're not talking about um, kind of objective truth, but the way that things are, um, you know, the way that understanding is construed, say, around a very particularly uh, complex issue is most of our issues that we're facing are incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. So another a corollary guidepost might be if something, if something, if you found a simple answer to something, you're probably wrong. <laughs> Life is complex and people are at least as complicated as we are. Mm -hmm. So if these one dimensional descriptions of other human beings seem so satisfying, we should be suspicious of yeah. ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have been talking about the, the characteristics or dy dynamics of uh, the groups that coalesce. I I'm curious about what is a malignant, narcissistic leader? How do, what does he or she get out of it? What motivates this person? How do we define it? How do we recognize it? Well, it starts with, according to Kernberg, I mean, mm -hmm. there are probably many theorists who talk about this, mm -hmm. but the basic character structure is the narcissistic personality disorder, and then a number of other cunning and somewhat psychopathic dynamics get added mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. In one way, it, it, it is a little bit what's resurfaced in the collective as the dark triad, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. often dark triad is a more subtle um, kind of boardroom um, element. This would be, a, you know, dark triad that is trying to take over a nation and crush it under their heel. So to start with just the narcissistic personality disorder, which again, as an aside, narcissism is showing up everywhere in social yeah. media right now. I know. Oh, they're a narcissist. Yeah. There's a narcissist. Here's another narcissist <laughs> where it's ridiculous. It's a um, slogan. <laughs> it's a slogan. Yeah. So um, our, these character disorders are extreme. It isn't that you know some, your your girlfriend was a little selfish, or your boyfriend forgot your birthday. I mean, we're talking about the entire foundation of the personality is tilted in a painful direction, often because of early childhood struggles. So. The narcissistic personality disorder has an exaggerated sense of self-importance, a preoccupation with fantasies of unlimitedness, unlimited success, a belief in one's specialness, exploitative relationships, and a demonstrable lack of empathy. And this is at the core of the malignant narcissist. So there is an inflated sense of self-importance. Only I can do this. A need for excessive attention and admiration, often very troubled relationships, and a lack of empathy. Now, psychoanalytically, there's different theories as to how we imagine the internal landscape of this person or how we imagine how this came to be. And, and now there's even a question because of neurobiology getting um, more sophisticated, there may even be some genetic predispositions mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. certain sure. traits as well. But the lack of empathy seems very important. That if, if a person cannot imagine the experience of any other person, it interferes with their ability to place any limits on their actions. And to me, that's one of the ways that I think when I'm working in my consulting room with somebody who is struggling with a strong narcissistic 
feature inside of themselves is that I'll ask them over and over again, how are you imagining the inner life of mm -hmm. the other person? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a very novel question. Mm -hmm. Often it's a very interesting question if they feel safe enough to enter into the conversation, but they will often realize after a while that it's really absent. Mm -hmm. Or it's instrumentalized, like, they can, I mean, a, a true narcissist would maybe be able to imagine what, what might be going on in the other person, but not in a way that engenders empathy, but in a way that the information is used for further manipulation. Yeah. You know, that's why some schools of psychoanalytic thought say, don't work with a narcissist, you're just going to make them a better narcissist. But um, of course, that's not, that's not the thinking in all schools. Because there's an emptiness with a narcissist, too, a lot of times. There's a need for, for mirroring, and that's, of course, um, Kohut's self-psychology is based on that. Heinz Kohut was another psychoanalyst. The need for followers, mm -hmm. uh, because that person sees him or herself uh, through mirrors. And the more followers that person has, the more sense of self although false, uh, seems to be um, engendered in the leader. Uh, I often think in my imagination, you know, when I read about people in the news, and I think, oh, gosh, what would that person be like, or what would that person do? How would that person survive uh, alone on a desert island? Mm. Uh, you know, in other words, does that person have an interiority and a sense of personhood and uh, inner solidity? Or, or is it all on the surface and all out there that everything is externalized, uh, you know, relationships and uh, the need for power and so on and so forth mm -hmm. uh, ver versus somebody uh, you could pick another, you know, famous figure of some sort who would be just as real and just as intact and just as human. Um, you know, on Robinson Crusoe's island. Yeah. Uh, because it's a way of sort of imagining is, is this is there a hollowness there? That's very interesting. Or an internal yeah. sense uh, of soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. What, an, what an interesting thought experiment. Uh, I feel I, the sadness about that, by the way. I've just, mm -hmm. um, I can just feel my own sense of how sad this it, it is. And uh, a, let's face it, a prevalence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of malignant narcissistic leadership. Mm -hmm. We're scared. We're anxious. Yeah. Jung said that dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Dream School is our 12-month self-paced online program that teaches you how to understand these important messages from the unconscious. We break down the essential skills teach you how to apply them, and offer opportunities for practice. You can become part of a vibrant community, join a dream group, or share your dream with other students. There are monthly live Q&As with Joseph, a chance for one-on-one -on -one time with Deb in her office hours, and monthly dream seminars with me, Lisa. Visit our website, thisjungianlife.com, to learn more or sign up. Something occurs inside of a person who is narcissistic. And from a Jungian standpoint, mm. that they are alienated from the self. And therefore, the self is dangerous to them. Mm. Mm. The self comes forward as something that is greater than the ego. Mm -hmm. And for all of us, there is a a sense that anything that is greater than the ego is is scary to us, particularly if it's something that we are unfamiliar with. 
And, even so, when the self appears, over time as the ego comes to accommodate the self, which is that transpersonal, some might even say divine center, the ego actually matures into a much more profoundly Mm -hmm. substantive participant. Now, the psychoanalytic tradition has that talks about drives. There are a couple of things that we can talk about that the preoccupation of the narcissistic personality is about inflation and deflation of Mm self-esteem. So how one is perceived and the feedback from the collective or from the family or the workplace actually changes how the individual experiences themselves. So the internal sense of whether or not the person is valuable is either over over exaggerated or collapsed and the truth is we live in the in between we're never as tiny as we imagine ourselves and we're never as grandiose mm-hmm. as we might imagine ourselves mm-hmm. but we're in mm-hmm. some middle space so there's a constant sense of self esteem the primary emotional tones in the narcissist are shame contempt and envy wow Mm. so the narcissist exists in an internal field an inner field of shame contempt and envy so they experience themselves as shameful and because that is so deflating they need to look out into the environment and shame others yeah so that the shameful thing is out there and the good thing is in here. Envy is something that's particularly dangerous in narcissists because unlike jealousy, where we might see that somebody has something that we aspire Mm -hmm. to, we might actually make a friend with that person and then ask for help. Yeah. Trying to find out how did how did you get this great thing? (laughs) Yeah. Would you give me a hand? Give me some coaching, give me some mentoring. Mm-hmm. Envy is a feeling of hatred towards the person that has the thing mm-hmm. that the narcissist might want, because the wanting of the other object is experienced as agonizing in the narcissist. And so the one that has that is attacked because the narcissist feels that you are hurting them by displaying something or being in a certain way. Contempt is, uh, is actually, it's so ubiquitous in the culture, it's, mm-hmm. I don't even know if we yeah. see it anymore, but contempt is this feeling that I deserve better, that everything or so much is beneath me. And boy, you just mm-hmm. see that on social media all the time, mm-hmm. what somebody is entitled to. And, and if they don't do that, out the door. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, I walked right up and I said thus and such because how dare they not do bum bum bum. So those are three really easily identifiable yeah. things. And so as you're looking at a leader, mm-hmm. ask yourself, where is their shame? Where is their contempt? And where is their envy to at least begin to ask a question? Is this person Mm. worthy of the trust that I am placing in them? The pathologic Mm. belief about self is I need to be perfect to feel okay. Yeah. And so the narcissist is trying in any number of ways. If the self esteem is garnered through appearance, The appearance has to be perfect in order to be okay. If it's about finances, whatever perfection means, I need 10 million, 20 million, some enormous amount of money, or I need the biggest house or the most perfect car. But there's some form of perfection or the self-esteem collapses. The primary 
pathologic belief about others is others enjoy riches, beauty, power, fame, and therefore the more of those, the better I will feel. And that to me is the real important piece. Because the narcissist is alienated from the true center of their personality, they actually don't experience pleasure or joy or satisfaction. Because satisfaction presupposes that there is some sense of who I am and what actualizing that would bring to me. Mm -hmm. That sense of, oh, I discovered I love to write, and then I write, and I love writing. And there's this continuity between what we've discovered and then what we're pursuing. But because the narcissist is alienated from themselves, they have to constantly shop and say, oh, oh, Deb really loves to cook. Well, that must mean that I need to get some of that because mm -hmm. I might like that. Or Lisa loves new cars, and so I, I guess I can see <laughs> her enjoying that. I'm just making stuff up, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I see somebody else legitimately delighting in something, I'm going to run to ape that behavior because I can't figure out any other yeah. way to find some of that in myself. The central way of defending against that agony in themselves is either idealizing or devaluing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a, a, a master description and many lecture that um, I hope people rewind and listen again about the characteristics of narcissism. And by the way, I do like to cook, and Lisa couldn't be less interested in cars. Uh, Clearly, I'm projecting my shadow onto both of you because I need to be cooking more, and I probably need a new car. So. Uh, there's a real sadness, uh, isn't there? Uh, that that hollowness and the the inner emptiness that it's never enough; it can never be sati satiated. You can't uh, get enough of the thing you don't need. Right. That's right. Such a great quote. And you're also just throwing darts at the wall, yeah. seeing if anything actually comes to who you really are yep. and really feel. You, you know, and I think we all have self doubt. Um, we compare ourselves to others. Uh, we we want the success, and it's. I think very easy under the quote leadership unquote of a malignant narcissist um, to abandon ourselves and um, say yes, you know that's right. It's all about them and give ourselves license to uh, experience contempt and falsely, uh, you know, accuse the other that the scapegoat and shame the other rather than ask ourselves, you know, what is it that I want? Um, how can I get there? Who could help me? Or just let ourselves feel our feelings of, uh, I wish I were doing better. I wish I could make more money. I wish, you know, whatever it is. Uh, versus put it on the other and and as if it didn't come from somewhere inside. Or as if the other is obstructing my access. Mm -hmm. as, to, as if. To the feeling. We yep. think they're obstructing our access to the thing. Right. Because we have the narcissistic fantasy. Well, if I had that size house, then <laughs> I would have these wonderful feelings. Oh, yes. And they're obstructing my right. access to that, so they become yeah. the problem. But it's actually a search for a feeling that mm -hmm. is at the deep, deep bottom of the narcissistic wound. And 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 by the way, we're talking about this as if it, you know, it applies to these people over there who are narcissists. <laughs> but everything that you're both beautifully talking about is something that, um, quote unquote, sort of normal neurotic people can experience too, that we can feel that sense of kind of being shut out 
from the good thing of that course. brings with it envy and resentment and a, and a sense yeah. of not being able to find that feeling and 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 uh, so that it's a it's sort yeah. of um it is a normal human experience that can become kind of characterological or can be characterological yeah. more more sort of yes. typical. I want to I want to um, raise this issue that that Kernberg talks about in his article about the relationship between the charismatic leader and the follower and what what is that and just a couple of quotes and then I want to bring in as Jung says something very similar so I thought it might be interesting to compare and contrast he says that um, you know one of the things that people get out of becoming a follower is the sense of not having to take responsibility for decisions. And in mass psychology, people get to project their ego ideal onto the leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, the, the participants then feel free because they've, they've sort of projected their ego ideal. They don't have responsibility. They then feel free to uh, participate in this movement and not feel any responsibility for the participation and the aggression against these outside groups. So they, they can just disavow it. And Jung says something very, very similar. I want to just read this. This is from volume seven. He says, the disciple is unworthy. Modestly, he sits at the master's feet and guards against having ideas of his own. Mental laziness becomes a virtue, which is exactly what Kernberg says too. One can at least bask in the sun of a semi-divine being. He can enjoy the archaism and infantilism of his unconscious fantasies without loss to himself, for all responsibility is laid at the master's door. Through his deification of the master, the disciple, apparently without noticing it, waxes in stature. So we get a little puffed up. We get to mm -hmm. feel more important. Moreover, does he not possess the great truth, not his own discovery, of course, but received straight from the master's hands. Naturally, the disciples always stick together, not out of love, but for the very <laughs> understandable purpose of effortlessly confirming their own convictions by an engendering an air of collective agreement. Uh, and then it, it goes on from there, but. Um, let me just let me just finish with this. One feels the full dignity and burden of such a position, deeming it a solemn duty and moral necessity to revile others not of a like mind, to enroll proselytes and to hold up a light to the Gentiles, exactly as though one were the prophet oneself. So you know, there's a lot in there that's Ooh. that's also in this group work that was done by Bion and others and. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Jung hints at there that, that also gets talked about is like one of the things that binds group together is a belief system. So, so people will latch on to an ideology because it, it helps the group cohere and mm -hmm. they'll, they'll look for a leader with a strong ideology because it provides that sense of, of safety and importance mm -hmm. and moral justification. So, you know, there's just a way where psychoanalysis uh, has a lot to say on this topic. Certainly does. And what you just read from Jung is pithy, uh, very incisive. Um, but what it takes me to is, I mean, we all belong to groups, yeah. <laughs> Star starting with families. And uh, what does a healthy followership look like? Mm -hmm. So we're certainly not saying never belong to a group and never share ideals. Uh, there's two sides to this coin. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Kernberg is talking about large group regression. Right. He's not talking about large groups. He's no, talking I, about the combination of those things. So I agree with you, Deb. Right. That just being part of a group, like forming a nation. You know, you yes. know welcome to 1776. <laughs> yeah. You know, the great yeah. adventure of groups of people have changed the course of the world for positive as well so, and so, created totally. civilizations. Yeah. Oh, and Jung, Jung didn't credit that enough. Yeah. My question still stands of, you know, I, if I belong to a group, 
that other people might think, uh, you know, really is uh, immature or regressed. I don't think that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So how, you know, we may not have uh, a good enough internal way of assessing, is this healthy? Am I being a healthy follower in service to something like creating a nation? I could only wish. But yeah. uh, okay, create, create a nation. A podcast. <laughs> okay, eggs. And or am I regressed and my followership is really not so healthy? Yeah. What does that self reflection look like? It's a great question. Kernberg was very explicit, at least in the article, that by understanding these concepts, what is large group regression? What are the qualities? What does the malignant narcissist really look like? And what I'd like to say is, I would not normalize this. While all of us may have tiny narcissistic tendencies, people with the disorder are only 1% of the population, and malignant narcissists Mm -hmm. may be a quarter of a percent or even less. These are extreme examples. Mm -hmm. It may be good for us to be able to find our narcissistic tendencies so we're not blind to it when we see them incredibly exaggerated in another person. Yeah. And we're not even talking about one of our coworkers on Wall Street who's just a dick. <laughs> and, you know, and, and <laughs> they behave, you know, like a narcissist. Right. They're not leading a nation into yeah, war. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're, they're, Big power is just being a pain in the ass, you know, among 20 people that share a floor. We're really talking about people that are exerting a level of power that is changing the fate of large groups of people and maybe the fate of a nation. And I would not, I would not normalize that or, or have an overly permissive attitude about any of that. I just want to drop in that. I don't want us to stop talking about the malignant narcissist because that's half of Kernberg's mm-hmm. concern is it's not just narcissism. On top of that is antisocial behavior, paranoia, mm-hmm. and aggression. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So people that have n- disregard for the law or norms, they are impulsive and deceitful. They do not care about the welfare of others. They're paranoid. They have an irrational mm-hmm. distrust of other people mm-hmm. and, and are bizarrely suspicious and, most importantly, aggression. And I really want to um, break out the difference between aggression and healthy self-assertion. Mm-hmm. Because in the culture, that differentiation is not discussed oh. mm-hmm. um, anywhere near enough. The true display of aggression is to injure another person, Mm -hmm. to dominate, to reinforce one's own sense of power over the other at any expense. Self-assertion, if it is done thoughtfully, is a dynamic intervention, but if it is well thought out and it has the effect that it should improve the conditions for everyone that is influenced Mm. in the context. You stand up and you make a complaint at the workplace because everyone or a large number of people are being negatively affected. You know, we think about um, this terrible event that that happened, uh, I believe it was in one of the sewing factories in the last hundred years where there were were no laws about having escape doors available. Yes, yeah. and this building went up in flames, and this this whole That's... worker um, staff were burned alive. Yeah, um, and so people had to stand up and say, "No, you cannot block an emergency exit. You cannot do that. You're not allowed." And people getting angry and shouting about it, not because they want to destroy, but because the entire context will be improved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm by the surgical application of intensity mm-hmm. to solve a problem. Yeah. Aggression is, in its true sense, is, an, is expressing destructiveness and hostility. Mm-hmm. And it is in service 
to enhancing the self-esteem of somebody who wants to experience themselves as powerful, to exert bizarre levels of control over other people, to give themselves, to reinforce a sense of omnipotence in that person. And that is dangerous. Yeah. Well, and Joseph, the one thing I want to sort of amend, I mean, I totally agree with everything you're saying. It's not just people who are leading countries. There are organizations that have this at their head. There are yeah. protest movements. And I think that a lot of it is the person seeking power. And so wherever there's a little bit of a vacuum of power, wherever there's a maybe a, a sort of something on the fringe or where there's a little bit of chaos or where there's a, a high degree of anxiety, people w with those personality traits, which you described so well, yes. will move in and take advantage of that. And the, the regressed group will look for that leader and that leader will look for that regressed group. Yes. And it will be the leader will clothe uh, his or her cause in this is good for you. So the or, the, or it's good for someone else or, that you're right. behaving righteously. Oh, exactly. That's the promise. Um, it, it, they don't stand up and say, uh, I want power and I wish to dominate. Right. They, they say there is a horrible injustice. This is what we talked about before, the, the fight or fight group. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, there's a, ter there's a tremendous need to uh, make things okay again. So it's, it's clothed in a promise that this is in, in uh, our collective good. And that requires us uh, to really engage in a process of discernment. And you are right. It does show up uh, in smaller ways. Although Kermit yeah. was, mm -hmm. he's writing this article because the impact of large groups being yes. sucked in, they can do yep. so much more damage. Of course, yes. Uh, to the collective. But you're right. In, a, yeah. in an office, you know, if, if there's a leader who is highly manipulative, strategically aggressive, has a paranoid oversight. That I mean, that's what we call a toxic workplace. Mm -hmm. There's a high level of secrecy and mistrust and fear. There's a stifling of communication, manipulating subordinate, uh, subordinates, uh, rewarding psychophantic behavior. We only want mm -hmm. people who will pledge allegiance to us at all levels to deliver veiled threats and to to create a culture of compliance over competence. Mm -hmm. And I really mm -hmm. want everyone to hear this. Because when you are assessing who you're going to work for, who you're going to vote for at every level, listen to what they're saying. And if they are promoting compliance over competence, that is dangerous to the functioning of the organization. Who wants incompetent people put into important roles that you depend on just because they have an allegiance to the leader. Right. Or to the belief system or the belief the cause. system. The cause. In these, yes. In these organizations, there's often very high turnover because mm -hmm. yeah. the leader is often volatile and abusive. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, some of us have worked in those environments. If you can understand malignant narcissism, you can get the heck out of there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. This is not a good place for any person. And then, of uh, course, on the larger way, this authoritarian governance, mm -hmm. social division, economic instability, those are the, the larger things. As an example of the corporate piece, if you guys remember Elizabeth Holmes and the mm -hmm. Theranos Corporation. Yep. Right. It's a say, great example. Say a little more about who she was and what, what her work was. Well, um, she misled stakeholders and gave yes. all these false claims about the company's capabilities and then, yeah. you know, created this financial um, and reputational collapse. Yeah. But, but say more about it, Deb. You're, I think you have this. Uh, she um, claimed that uh, with a, a pinprick on a finger and a few drops of blood, that, that things could be diagnosed and ascertained about 
health and, and illness. And of course, it would be a huge benefit if, if, if this were the case. And it would, um, you know, eliminate the need for um, more substantive uh, diagnostic procedures or um, withdrawing blood, et cetera. And it was a complete hoax. And many important people fell for it, so to speak. Uh, and there is a great example of malignant mm -hmm. narcissism mm -hmm. uh, in a company. A and I'll reiterate my point. I think in large groups, oftentimes, it is clothed in righteousness, goodness, and I am doing this for you, you know, my followers, my public fellow citizens. Um, so there's always a promise, as there was with Elizabeth Holmes. This is a good thing. Uh, and it may be the same. And there are people at work, uh, the president of the XYZ company, who can be toxic, volatile, and he doesn't have to present him or herself as uh, doing it for your benefit because, hey, it's his company. So he can shout and pound the table and... Um, Take it or leave it. The Purdue and, Pharmacy and Oxycontin. Mm -hmm. This is going yep. to transform. Yep. This is a virtue. Right. People yep. are crippled by pain. It's a great example. Yet they knew. Great example. It, I mean, it's one thing to go in and, and discover horrifically that the thing you really did believe was virtuous is a problem, but yeah. they knew this was a, going to be incredibly addictive, and that was a very exciting and promising profiteering. Mm -hmm. Can I just read a couple yeah. of lines from the Kernberg article just to support yeah. what you're both saying? And, and Joseph, you were, you were raising this great point about what these organizations can look like. I thought this was really interesting. So these organizations, one run by a malignant narcissist, evolve uh, a sharp differentiation of levels of emotional climates. At the top of the organization surrounding the leadership with malignant narcissism are individuals who also present narcissistic and antisocial features. They have learned to adjust themselves to the needs of the leader to be both loved and feared while being unaffected by his interpersonal demandingness and at times antisocial maneuvers. So leadership with antisocial features expands corruption at the top. At the second level of organizational functioning, including the large majority of professional and institutional staff, there develops an intensely paranoid atmosphere because of the fear of the leader who is hypersensitive to criticism, who needs to be showed love and admiration, <laughs> and who cannot listen to anything running against his or her will. And then at the bottom, uh, they're, they're the periphery, they're, most of the capable staff members are depressed and alienated, and they're likely to be the first ones to leave, and there may be a high degree of turnover and, and that kind of thing. So I thought that was super interesting and, and right to your point. Mm -hmm. I think that um, we, we do see all of this happening right in front of us, and right. our job is to just have our eyes open. Another good example of this yeah. was Kellyanne Conway, mm. um, oh. who was a spokesperson in the uh, Trump yep. uh, organization. And clearly, she was transformed by being in the proximity of all of that to the point that her husband divorced her, that he couldn't, he couldn't tolerate mm -hmm. being part of this process that she was propping up. He founded an organization to actually expose mm -hmm. what she was doing to try to unravel mm -hmm. some of the malfeasance. And her daughter alienated herself. Clearly, the marriage had been working. She had a relationship with her daughter. But being in the proximity of that kind of malignant narcissism changed her. And the people around her then could not tolerate her. So that, I mean, this goes to the example of the infective um, anxiety. Mm -hmm. Another example yeah. is Harvey Weinstein. Uh-huh. Um, we have a long list here. But it's important for us to 
have examples. Bernie Madoff. This incredible control over the projects, these public outbursts, the manipulation, volatile relations, all kinds of legal problems. Harvey doing whatever he could to get whatever he wanted. And people around him saying that there was a strange way that he was terrifying, but had an almost childlike quality that made them like him as well, Mm -hmm. which goes to really the seed of the narcissism, Mm. because the narcissist is a distraught child. Mm. Mm -hmm. And and that Mm. and that creates a very complicated feeling. Mm. Mm. And then the political leaders are endless. Yeah. Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Saddam Hussein, Idi Amin, Nicolas Maduro, uh, Rodrigo Duarte, Erdogan, uh, Lukashenko, Kim Jong-un, Putin. Uh, Viktor Orban. I mean, there is something about um, the malignant narcissist rising to power, or I think what Kernberg is saying, which is very sobering, is that regressed groups lift them to power. Mm-hmm. Mm. These, these people are not gods. They do not command the universe. Mm-hmm. But, and this was so enlightening to me about um, looking at his, Kernberg's work, is the group begins to list into this incredible distress, and then they search for a leader. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They search for a malignant narcissist because it seems that the false sense of competence, the simplistic explanations, the promise of savagery yeah. in service to protecting you is so yeah. seductive, and they will disregard more temperate leaders. The world is full of people mm-hmm. with broken souls. Mm-hmm. It's our fault, your fault, my fault for venerating them just. Because you're frightened. Ah. And when, when one side is using that kind of language, it frightens people on the other side, and the same dynamic gets going. Right. So, so you're, you're uh, coalescing around a kind of paternal figure who's saying, don't worry, calm down, mm-hmm, we'll take yeah. care of it, we'll protect you, the tranquilizing effect of the alternative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we have obviously had a very great deal to say on this topic. And um, I, I think as we transition to a dream, you know, what I take from all this is each of us has a responsibility as an individual to choose, to discern to reflect, to investigate. Uh, It's on each of us to be as conscious as we can about what we believe, who we follow, what our values are. But with that, where we look every week uh, to see what is within is to our own dream maker and our unconscious and what it has to say to us in dreams. Today's dreamer is a woman who's 40 years old and she works as an acupuncturist and the title of her dream is Killing the Crab. Here's the dream. I was in my friend's apartment, but it wasn't their place. My friends are a married couple, a man and a woman. I think I was house sitting while they were away. Before they left, I went over. In their kitchen was this crab, a big crab, not life size, was running around everywhere, zooming on the ceiling, then on the floor near the kitchen island. For some reason, I was tasked with taking care of it. I essentially had to kill the crab. I had some sort of little knife, and we danced back and forth before I stabbed it right in its head. Before that, the crab sunk three of its legs into my left calf, 
one on the side, one in the back, and one just above my knee. I was shocked that it didn't hurt, but they were big. My friend's wife got to work immediately and just pulled them out. I can remember the feeling of her pulling them out. There was a lot of blood. It was pretty uncomfortable. After pulling them out, nothing really happened, and I walked towards the kitchen sink and said, Oh, I don't feel great. She asked me, Do you have ringing in your ears right now? I said no, and then realized there was blood coming out of my ears and lightly out of my eyes. I think she was about to call an ambulance, and I realized there was probably some poison in the crab legs. Then I woke up. And she says, I think work and where my career is heading is creating some stress. I'm struggling with the dynamic of being present and not trying to hold on to control. The main feelings in the dream were a bit of shock. It was pretty weirdly violent. The blood at the end left me feeling like, am I okay? And uh, for associations, she says, crabs I associate as resilient creatures. They live at the bottom of the sea and have a nice time. Mm -hmm. Also, in an astrological context, cancer is the crab, and uh, they have a hard exterior and protection, but have big feelings. I think she means uh, people who, have, who are cancers. So there was something about emotional vulnerability with myself, owning perhaps a shadow aspect. The moon rules cancer the crab also. My friend's wife is who helped me, so perhaps a connection to feminine and my resistance to seeing power and softness. I don't really know what to do with the blood coming out of my ears and eyes. Perhaps I'm scared to see or worried to see or hear myself or my own power. So, killing that crab. So the dream opens up that she's she's not in a familiar place. We know that there's something novel about the part of her psyche. And there's something about the married couple. So she and in the proximity of the archetype or the complex of the marriage and the married couple. And she's been tasked with taking care of their possessions taking care of their home, uh, being vigilant, making sure everything is in good order when they return. So she's set up as a kind of proxy for the married couple. So that that evokes a certain kind of feeling, a certain Mm -hmm. kind of energy. And it seems that in the proximity of the married couple, these events then spring forth. Yeah. And and it's too bad that we don't have the dreamer here to ask her, who yeah. is this couple and who are they to you and what are your associations with these people, because uh, that that would be uh, that would be telling. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, I so. I paid attention to the fact that she's an acupuncturist, mm. <laughs> That's and great. It, and has been punctured. Yeah. And. Um, I, you know, I, I once had the, the most odd experience with acupuncture. I could tell that I was coming down with a cold. Mm. And um, I had an acupuncture appointment and told the acupuncturist, this is, this, this is what's happening. And about half an hour after I left, I could feel all my symptoms disappear. <gasps> wow. Very cool. Uh, it was memorable, obviously. So mm. what I'm wondering about is whether her being punctured in in a leg has somehow led to the blood coming out of another part of her body. Mm. Uh, what's what's the connection there, um, if any? Yeah, I mean that's interesting. Um... You know, my own association to that, and I guess we're sort of jumping to the end, but it's a very, Mm -hmm. um, Mm. it's a very uh, kind of vivid ending to the dream, right? It kind of, there is, there is a certain resolution to this dream. The crab has been killed, but she's been wounded and there's a sense that she needs to go to the hospital. So 
Um, my own association is she mentions poison. And what happens when you get mm. bitten by a snake or a spider, I think, is that the venom goes to work. And, um, you know, at least in the case of spiders, I mean, spider venom liquefies the, their prey. So, and then they kind of suck it out, right? So I have this image almost of the poison from the, the crab's legs has somehow mm-hmm. created some sort of inner salutio where now the blood is flowing <laughs> from her eyes and ears. So there's been a real significant wound that has caused a change of state. Mm-hmm. And now it needs to be attended to. She needs to go to the hospital. She, you know, there's an ambulance called. And we often think about that imagery in dreams about going to the hospital as, you know, okay, what what kind of uh, uh, care of the soul is now required? Mm -hmm. I I really like that idea about the salutio. Uh, Well, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but I'm glad you like it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. you know, and what's blood? Blood is has long represented the life force. Mm-hmm. It's it's what flows within yeah. us, what circulates from head to toe, uh, and everywhere. And where is the wound? Mm-hmm. As you said, where she needs to go to the hospital. What what needs attention? And our dreamer herself has uh, hypothesized. Um, that maybe it has to do with being scared to see mm-hmm. or worried about hearing of uh, some anxiety about, you know, those are organs of perception. Yeah. Is there something she is leery of taking in and perceiving? But, you know, I want to go back to Joseph's point about, okay, so this is in the house. This is in the archetype of the married couple. And again, I wish we had personal associations to that couple because I think that could matter a lot. But without that, um, you know, she's house sitting, which is an interesting term. And it's an interest. It's a, you know, when you house sit, it, you're there very temporarily. And, and I, and so I could make up that maybe, you know, she says there's a lot of, uh, tension around her work and not knowing what's going to happen with her work. But I do wonder, is there also some tension somewhere in her personal life, maybe in her own relationship to the archetype mm-hmm. of marriage? Again, uh, mm-hmm. I wish I knew more about the couple because I might say something different if I did. But, uh, but, but the idea of house sitting is that you're kind of filling in. Yeah. You're sort of, mm-hmm. you're almost playing at being the owner of the house or something. Mm-hmm. Trying so, it on. Right. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And the sign of cancer is associated with the home. I think in, in part because the, the hard exoskeleton of the crab is kind of the house that it takes with itself in all places. Mm. Cancerians are thought mm-hmm. to prioritize the home and entertainment, the safety of the home, the comfort of the home. In some ways, it's very archetypally feminine in that mothering dynamic and associated with Luna and the moon. So she's in the marital home and she is in charge, particularly of the home. She's not in charge of the people or the marriage, but that something about the care of the home has been transferred from them into her. And so the home crab has bit her, so to speak. <laughs> and people talk about being exposed to something and you're like, oh, I've got, I've got the marriage thing. I've got the house thing. It kind of bit me and now it's inside of me. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if on one level that, um, I mean, it would sound a little superficial in one way, that the idea of owning a home has kind of nipped her and injected her with a little bit of something and it looks like it's an anticoagulant yeah that's interesting yeah so the salutio right Mm -hmm. (laughs) more evidence (laughs) for salutio oh yeah right (laughs) things are flowing yeah Um, the conscious ego is (laughs) i can imagine saying you're not going to turn me into a homeowner i'll kill you first (laughs) 
and just refusing to take on some of that energy, perhaps. But it could also yeah. be a psychological home. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I can't help um, thinking about uh, Krabby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of connotations to Crab. But I want to try something out on you guys. I'll just pretend you, you ha we haven't read this dream, and I'm just reading okay. this to you, this part right. of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I went over, and in this kitchen was this crab, uh, a big crab, but not life-size. Uh, the crab was running around everywhere, zooming on the ceiling, the floor near the kitchen island. For some reason, I was tasked with taking care of it. I essentially had to kill this crab. I had some sort of little knife, and we did a dance back and forth before I stabbed it right in its head. <laughs> That's my experiment. There is something fun, yeah. lighthearted, yeah, 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 yeah. zany, yeah. Com and downright comedic. Or even playful or <gasps> fun. Fencing oh, with the crab. Right, right. The dance. I, I did have this sense of her, you know, yeah. doing that. Um, so, so I wonder, yeah. you know, it's sort of we're t very serious, like, oh, my goodness, you know, archetypal stuff. And it's all there. It's all mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And there is something fun and comedic and sort of like little kid. Yeah. Of, you like, know? And yeah. so, you know, I just punched him right in the nose. and. Uh, yeah, th that kind of spirit, right? Where the aggression um, ha has an innocence to it, or mm -hmm. uh, something along those lines. Yeah. So that makes me think that being in the proximity of the married couple evokes the parent complex, ah. which then might stimulate the puella, the playful puella mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. of her, and then That's she's interesting having yeah, these fencing matches with crabs and she's triumphant. And then her wound is being cared for. She kind of has a boo-boo. Mm -hmm. And then the mother yeah. is, is caring for right. her. Yeah. But, but, you know, you said Puella and, and that sent me off in a slightly different place because mm -hmm. there, there, is a, there is something young about being the house sitter, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not childlike. But a babysitter, a house sitter, a dog sitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's pr something provisional. It's a good word for it. And, and then um, the, the, the crab, I mean, you're right, Deb, there's something kind of charming about this crab. But there is also something dangerous about this crab in the end. And mm -hmm. crabs in general, I mean, I'm thinking about it like mythically and archetypally. They, uh, you know, Jung had a, a patient who had a, a crab dream. And Jung, I think, talked about how it's a regressive pull because they move backwards and sideways. Ah. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, you know, they're very, I'm, I'm going to say it, they're very kind of chthonic, you know, they're, they're like little monsters, you know, and they uh, are associated with the mother and in particular the negative mother. And they're associated with the moon and the unconscious right. and they kind of live in the, in the water. And so is there something heavy, maybe possibly even, ha even having to do with a negative mother that is, that is um, you know, the dreamer wants to kill this to take care of it in the sort of like mafia right. sense. Right. <laughs> take, um, care, take care of this for me. <laughs> right. But, um, but. But, you know, it needs to infect her and maybe bring her down to earth a little bit. I mean, I am wildly making this up because I really don't know that much about this dreamer. But I, I, could, I could sort of pick up on your use of the word puella and sort of say, no, it's time for you to um, get bit <laughs> and, and uh, m maybe, maybe um, tend to your wounds and have a shift of orientation here. Well, I think there is definitely an invitation, and she has been changed. Yeah. Something has been transferred from the crab archetype, you uh -huh. might say, yeah. into, into the ego. And as mm -hmm. archetypes do, they change us. They 
yeah. activate certain predispositions. Yes. And again, if we think about it astrologically, it might have something to do with the home, but it might be something much stranger and ancient and mm-hmm. mysterious. These creatures that haven't changed for millions and millions of years, right. which also means they're well adapted, by the yeah. way, mm-hmm. to the world. Mm-hmm. The alligators, other creatures that have just not changed, they're, they're doing pretty well in this great wide world. There are such things as venomous crabs, which, by the way, I had to look up because I was thinking, <laughs> does this exist in the world? Yeah, yeah, tell us. But they're called uh, xanthides, oh. which is a family of crabs that have highly venomous toxins, which are not destroyed by cooking, and for which there is no known antidote. And ah. they are produced by bacteria that live uh, symbiotically Mm -hmm. uh, inside of the crab. Mm. So it's not a true venom, but it's that they are, um, yeah, they're exposed to something. So if you wanted to um, come up with a creative way to off someone, you could just serve them one of these crabs. There you go. Ah. Somehow this excretion from the bacteria would create, create a problem. What a great idea for a TV show. Uh, A new way for Medea to get rid of people, you know. Yes. I I want to call our attention to some, a little detail, which is um, that the crab sunk three of its Mm -hmm. legs into my left calf. Yeah. Well, um, crabs have pincers, not, that's how they nip and bite. Yep. So if this happened in the so-called real world, in our waking world, we'd say, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. How could it stick a leg into the back of your, what? And also, if there, there are pinchers, there's usually one claw that is bigger and dominant, so to speak, and another that is smaller. So there would be two, not three nips or bites. Mm-hmm. So, you know, here's something that's pretty dramatic and really piercing, uh, which uh, in the natural world, crabs are not capable of. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a tendency here, uh, uh, some way that the injury in the dream is represented as bigger and more dramatic uh, than a than it could be um, by, by a crab. And I'm wondering if the ambulance ride is a corollary to that. Kind of histrionic exaggeration, a kind of Alice in Wonderland. It's yeah. big, it's small, it goes all around. It, it, and it all represents feeling, you know, mm-hmm. rather than actuality the way that um, I, I, I remember a niece who was a teenager fell off her bike Mm-hmm. And and she was absolutely distraught when she came running in. I was so upset, and it was so shocking, and it really was. And, you know, we all tended to her, and her physical injuries were not that great. Uh, there were scrapes and bumps, and there was a bruise. And and so I'm wondering if um, some, somehow... What's the injury, really? Well, well, what I would say, though, is that there is blood coming out of her ears and her eyes. Mm-hmm. That's pretty bad. <laughs> and it's... <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, Point it's, taken. <laughs> and it's the shadow figure, as it were, who points it out to her. Mm, okay. So, so I, think, I think that, you know, in a way, the ego is sort of like, oh, you know, whatever, I'm going to just go over here. And then it's like the shadow figure, the, the woman is like, um, are you okay? Yeah. Well, I also was wondering about the, about the phrase ringing in the ears, you know, yeah. I think there, there might be a wordplay there or something to do with that. But so I, I'm going to say that there's, there is some real... Something now, maybe it's not, and maybe it's not so much as an injury as a transformation mm-hmm. that that looks very distressing to the ego. But I think it's substantive. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to point to. Yeah, yep. Um, 
I also want to say that the she and the crab become increasingly similar the more they interact with each other. Yeah. That she's tasked with killing. She's got a little knife, and then all of a sudden, the crab is fencing with her, and its legs have been turned into little knives. Yes. So yeah. there's this interesting mirroring process that goes on. Oh, yeah. you're going to stab? I'll show you what it's like to stab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and back and yeah. forth. It's I, like the unconscious turns the same face to her that she turns to mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I am interested now in the idea of I was tasked with taking care of it. So it, so somebody hires you to come and, oh, would you do me a favor, Lisa? I, come and house it, you know, down at Edenton. It'll be lovely. Oh, now that you've arrived, take care of the <laughs> hyena that lives in the basement, and I'll be back tomorrow. We're in a couple of weeks. Good luck. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> there's a little, there's a little surprise there. That's great. Yeah. Nothing comes yeah. free. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Uh, interestingly, as she's house sitting, the friends are actually there. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the house is not vacant. Not right. yet. Not yet. Right. Um, so, one thing that the streamer may want to try is doing an active imagination. Mm -hmm. And. Mm maybe having a conversation with the crab. And if you don't know what it's like to work with active imagination with your dreams, well, then you should join dream school, <laughs> which is, which is our oh, uh, good, good segue. Yep, It's our 12 month <laughs> online self-paced program that teaches you how to work with your dreams. And there is a whole module on working with your dreams using active imagination. So I would be curious to see what that crab had to say. Mm -hmm. The crab has got some opinions. Yes. The crab's also kind of a ghost, right? I still think this has something to do with the family complex. Mm -hmm. That She's got a little crabby ghost running around <laughs> that she's trying to deal with, and uh, she's gotten mm -hmm. nipped by it. Yeah. You know, there are <laughs> such things as ghost crabs. Oh, I like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Venomous ghost crabs. Well, mm -hmm. they're, they're ones that are in, land yeah. dwelling. They are, yeah. They um, they're not venomous, but they <laughs> they uh, we, you know, they're on the the beaches in in Delaware, and they're so cute. <laughs> God, they're so cute, and they they dig these holes in the sand, and then they just come up and they just like kind of peek out, and if, you, if they feel you walking, they'll just go back in. But they're um, they're. They're little, interesting little critters. So, Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisjungianlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.